I, I've, I've virtually got myself a fleet of canoes and uh, and why I'm undertaking building another birch bark canoe is a bit beyond me but uh, I just love doing them I love the way they they paddle um, there's kind of like a leaf in the water uh, they paddle different than any other sort of modern materials but the common belief is that birch bark canoes are a fragile thing I, I can flip this canoe over and literally take a, a canoe paddle to the bottom of it and wail on it and it will do no harm to it the two vulner vulnerable areas are the bow and the stern because you can't get a you can't get a rib in that tight of a bend right in the front so uh, those are areas to watch uh, as long as you don't impact a rock head on you're going to be fine if it's grazing over a rock in the bottom it's as good as they say like i said any any canoe material what we have here is a classic example of the vulnerable area of the canoe so yeah in a set of rapids once we we ding one pretty good but the the neat part of a birch bark canoe is one can go to shore um, find the material to, to do a a, a pretty quick fix uh, when you're on the river. I do carry a small tin of uh, rendered down uh, spruce gum that I can use for the pitching material. So this this particular canoe, it, it's uh, I think 16 years old this year, and it, it's it still works pretty good. It's it's getting a little tired. Um, it's a long nose Ojibwe, which is my favorite style. I've built different ones, but I'm going to try to replicate this only. I'm going to, in my next canoe build, I'm going to build a slightly smaller one. So it's going to be a solo canoe. Uh, this one has continuous lacing, as you can see, from front to back. So there's over 500 feet of root in this canoe. Um, and the gunnels, we've got a gunnel cap and just a single gunnel underneath that's sort of egg-shaped that uh, the bark is sewn to. The canoe I'm going to build is the uh, more traditional. It's going to have an inner an outer gunnel and a cap. So I need three pieces for, for the gunnels of the next canoe. So we're, we're attempting to do this canoe build out like a tutorial, as I mentioned earlier. And um, if one's thinking of entertaining, taking on this project, there are three three books that are um, uh, this one not essential however it's it's a great read and it's called uh, the Can uh, the canoe uh, living tradition uh, and it's written by a uh, John Jennings so it's a great book on the history of canoe follows it all canoes birch bark dugouts right up to modern times skin boats as well and so it's a great sort of pictorial book if if you would on the build the next most important uh, book is one written by a Tap and Adney, and it's called Bark Canoes: The Art and Obsession of Tap, Tap and Adney. And what Tap did, he was born in 1838 in the States. He lived most of his adult life in um, in Canada, and he was a surveyor. And in the late 1800s, he saw that the the birch bark canoe was going out of favor for other materials. So the Hudson Bay Company were starting to cloth cover. Um, uh, a ribbed canoe uh, in, in, instead of using skin or the bark as a skin covering for it. So what um, Tappan did was he, he built um, 124 scale models of every type of birch bark canoe. So as a surveyor he traveled all across Canada and he, he met with pretty much every tribe right up into the Arctic. So the book even c contains uh, skin canoes in it, which he also made models of. And I have trouble doing it with ribs this size, but he's doing it 124 scale and tiny, tiny little bits of root. And so it's an amazing coffee table book. But what he did for living historians is he preserved the birch bark canoe, if you would. So we don't just build generic canoes. So, you know, a canoe's pointed at both ends, it's wider in the middle, you paddle it facing forward. We build canoes that were actually um, used by the different uh, indigenous peoples. So the one we're going to be building here is uh, Long Nose Ojibwe, which is my favorite style. But he covers the Algonquin, the Cree, the uh, Mohawk, um, the Beothic. They're all covered in this book, and it's a great read. But what is the real tool in the Bible is this guy. And it's called The Bark Canoes and Skin Boats of North America. And, and it's written by a Howard Chappelle, 
And what he's done is he's taken, um, he had the privilege of looking at Tappan's, um, all of his models. He scaled them back up and he's, so he's drawn scale drawings of this one would be a Mi'kmaq canoe, um, et cetera. So you can use this book as a guide. It also is page by page. I've got this thing earmarked. I've got it highlighted in a lot of spots that gives a step-by-step -step process in, in building a traditional birch bark canoe. So I'm going to be building mine on this bench and I've got to get, um, I've got to get a tarp set up over top of it because I'm going to be here for quite a few weeks in the, in the process of building this. So traditionally canoes were built on the ground. The natives would find a, a sandy area, a nice flat area, and they would drive stakes to form the shape of the gunnels in the canoe. Shortly after European contact with the, particularly with the French in, in, in the Canadas, um, when the French saw the advantages of this canoe and wanted to scale it up, they had canoe building sheds. Most of the people that worked in, uh, for them were indigenous peoples. And they found by building a bench, it was more ergonomic, got you up off the ground, and they could produce canoes quicker and, and better. So we're going to be building on this. I've got all the ribs done at this point. Um, so the whole process is really making a whole bunch of parts. Now, once you get all the parts done, well, then you just put the whole thing together. And um, I think I mentioned in an earlier video, it's, it's one of the if, if not the only canoe that you, you build the outside first and then you build the frame on the inside. So you, you're going to see a step by step as we go through this. We're going to put it in a playlist so you can, you can follow along if you want. So ribs are all done and I've started the sheathing over here. So here's where, where I'm at with the manufacturing of the bits and pieces of a canoe. So the first thing I did was I took, took my logs and I split them in half, then I split them in quarters. Uh, the next thing you, you saw me doing over there, I'm taking that heartwood out. That's just going to be kindling. Everything's going to get used. And, and you produce a lot of kindling when you build a birch bark canoe. But those longer pieces are going to go in the center of the canoe. So the sheathing is going to be paper thin uh, and it runs longitudinally in the canoe and the ribs cross it at 90 degrees. So the long ones there and over here, uh, which I've been working on, are some of the shorter ones and they're going to go in the bow and the stern. So I've got a few shaped out here and I'm going to actually draw one out. Oh yeah, uh, just before I get at um, shaping out my first piece of sheathing, um, I've roughed out my, my gunnels and my uh, gunnel caps. So it takes three pieces per side. They're pretty crude at this point. Um, so you've got a, an inner gunnel, a outer gunnel, which sandwiches the bark between the two. And then it gets laced between the ribs, the length of the canoe. And then it'll have a gunnel cap. And its sole purpose really is to protect the root um, from damage from the paddler as he's paddling. Anyway, that's another day I'm going to get out a piece of sheeting. Hi golly, there he is. How you doing, Chris? Good, how are you, Peter? Good, we finally meet. We finally meet. We finally meet, yeah. wow, have a chair. Thank you, long walk. Long walk, all the way from the Magnetowan River. Yeah. That's a, uh, a crazy good white water river, I understand. A lot of, uh, lot of history there. A lot of history, and you're an avid canoeist to boot. I do like to canoe. And one of the reasons you came here is you're gonna help me build a canoe. 
I'd like to, to learn more for sure about building a birch bark canoe. I'll tell you, with two of us, we could have it floating by tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe not, <laughs> maybe not. So uh, Chris, Chris is a blacksmith and he's the fourth uh, blacksmith that I've had the pleasure of meeting and learning from uh, in the past month. And uh, I'll tell you, these are some pretty uh, talented people taking up this trade. So you left the, the big paying job to start your own business in blacksmithing. I did, yeah. yeah. Three years ago, I decided I would just blacksmith, which was a hobby, and now it's my full-time job. Full-time job. And you live off-grid? I live off-grid on, on the river. On the beautiful Magnetowan River. Yeah. I bet you got a canoe. I have a few. A few, yeah. <laughs> Good stuff. And I'd like one more. One more. So you mentioned you were bringing me a gift. I, and I did bring you a gift. Well, look at that. Isn't that amazing? I heard you were building things. Yeah, I've been building a few things, that's for sure. Anyway, Chris, Chris uh, was mentioning that some of the hammers I use weren't too historically accurate. So uh, he forged this guy out. So it, it's a pretty good example or a reproduction, if you would, of a very early uh, claw hammer. Uh, the first uh, evidence we have of a claw hammer is early 1600s and it probably goes back a lot further than that but there's an oil painting from I believe it's from Holland and you can see a claw hammer in the painting leaning against the workshop wall and it's definitely a claw hammer and it looked a whole lot like that so how, how long to, to make that uh, a couple hours couple, couple hours from a piece of uh, medium carbon steel and on the anvil yeah yeah and you've hardened it? It's been quenched in water and then it's been drawn back to a straw color. Yep. Perfect. Should, uh, should serve you well. It should serve me well. Wow, that's beautiful. Beautiful piece of work. And you also mentioned you make, uh, or you made yourself a crooked knife. I did, yeah. And, uh, you know, thought we'd give it a go today and see how, see how it works. They're an amazing tool, but they're a hard tool to master. That mm -hmm. it doesn't come overnight. You have to scrape away at a lot of wood before it comes naturally. But with your help, maybe I can get this canoe uh, built a little quicker. Well, it's kind of slow doing it by oneself. Let's do it. You want to try? Yeah. Let's see what it'll do. So what what I'm doing, uh, Chris, is I'm making sheathing. So here's a couple of pieces that I've finished. So these are the real thin pieces that, that are going to go longitudinally in the canoe, and the ribs cross them at 90 degree angles. And, and without that sheathing, you would have a very weak craft. Um, but with it, you, you can stand in the canoe, you can wail away at the bottom. It, it's where the canoe gets its strength. So we're gonna skin on the outside of that. The ribs go 90 degrees across. So you can see they're fairly, fairly thin and tapered out right to an, a sharp edge, if you would, along here. And the reason for that, this one's not quite done, but when they lay in the canoe, we want them to lay in like overlapping like that. Mm -hmm. So so by, by having them overlap like that, we get rid of um, bulges so that when we get to the point and the whole inner canoe is lined with those. So and we put in some temporary um, ribs to hold them in place. Mm -hmm. And then we steam and bend the actual ribs. I've got them all done. Uh, they get bent, pre-bent, we dry them. And then we're gonna drive them in one, one at a time. And the whole canoe goes from this sort of flat bottomed tug it's going to be built on this bench so it's going to be flat and it transforms into this beautiful shape of the canoes that we we love to paddle nice so that's uh, what we're going to do um, natives did it just with crooked knives and before european contact they used uh, rib bones from large animals like elk buffalo moose uh, and they do work mm -hmm. uh, you got to sharpen them frequently but but they do work but they once they had steel, they quickly uh, adopted that and also the draw knife. So I use a draw knife a lot to get the thickness down. Mm -hmm. And then I use the crooked knife to feather out those edges. And the last step you're going to do is we're going to point the ends a bit like that. This one still has to be tapered down. So we want this tapered down to a, a really sharp point as well, because the longer ones will go in the center portion of the canoe and the shorter ones go from the center up into the bow and stern. So when they, when they overlap, we want that same um, sort of splice, if you would, of the two merging so we don't end up with bulges and, and the ribs will fit nice and tight against the sheathing. Okay. 
So let's whittle a few out. Don't matter if you wreck a few for the first ones. <laughs> All right, we'll get a raw piece here and, and we'll start. Actually, I got a piece over here on the bench. Okay. That's, a, that's your first piece of sheathing you've ever done, and the first time you've ever used a curtain knife. Yep. The first time I did it, I wrecked the first four. So, uh, yeah, like what I did when I was doing it, I actually got so thin that I poked holes in it all over the place. They can still be usable, but that's a, that's a really pretty piece of sheathing. That's going to do a good job. Perfect. Another one? Yeah. Okay. 